American submarines ply the oceans of the world. They travel fast, they travel deep, and they do it silently. Our submarine force wasn't always as adept or global. It had been a coastal patrol force, but during World War II, subs became a strategic part of our arsenal, accounting for the majority of the shipping sunk in the Pacific theater. The boats in our fleet changed during the war, as did tactics, ordnance, and most importantly, training. The story of that era is told by retired Admiral Maurice Rinskoff, who was the youngest fleet boat commander during World War II. I was born September 27, 1917, and probably kept my father out of the draft for World War I. There are three, really three aspects to learning to be a submariner. One is to operate the ship on the surface. Second is to learn to dive it. And the third is to make torpedo attacks. So uh, in my day, the primary training we had to handling ships on the surface was uh, when we went to sea on these, what we call school boats who were based in New London, uh, about eight or ten of us would go to go out in each ship every day and we'd have a chance to handle the ship. That's how we learned maneuvering and, and ship handling. It was a pretty crude piece of machinery. No air conditioning. Uh, it could dive maybe to 150 feet uh, only. Uh, make about 12 knots on the surface and about eight submerged for a very short time. The hull was riveted, and every time we dove, you could hear it creak, and occasionally you'd see a little water weeping in. Uh, if you were at 100 feet, you might get a little weepage. It had three bunks for officers, and about 20, 15 or 20 bunks for the men, so that they all had the hot bunk, as it's called. Uh, three, three guys using two bunks, because one was always on watch. The food, at that point, even the submarine, was superior. And that was one of the come-ons to people who uh, got into submarines. They got better food. They got paid a little bit more, not much. Uh, we were capable of going out for a couple of weeks and uh, making a patrol and coming back. And you had to refuel. You had to get more food and give the crew a chance to rest. It's quite clear that the powers that be in Washington realized that the submarine force would need more people as time went on because we were getting involved. The process during the war for the submarines was go out and make about four patrols and that meant approximately a year, 60 days at sea, about 25 days in port, sometimes maybe in Pearl Harbor. Attacking submarines you treat it just like any other ship. You know, he's, he's there on the surface. That's the only way at that point you could shoot at him. And uh, you make your approach and get into the right position. And, and everybody understands what shooting ducks is like. You have to lead the target. So you lead the target. And hopefully you got the, his course and speed right. And you sink him. And we did sink several Japanese submarines in, in the Pacific. We had innumerable failures where the torpedo should have gone off on the very first attack we made we fired at a small uh, escort vessel perfect shot nothing happened the torpedo ran too deep and it didn't the explosion didn't uh, recognize the signal and it didn't go off the other problems we had uh, was that uh, occasionally a torpedo would hit a target and because it made it hit at a 90 degree angle the firing pin deformed because before it could explode the, the forehead, and it was a dud. By the war's end, the torpedo problems had been fixed, and the submarine force in the Pacific theater had accounted for 30% of the Imperial Navy shipping sunk, as well as 60% of the Japanese merchant marine sunk. After World War II, Admiral Rinskoff continued his naval career at the dawn of the nuclear navy. Along came Captain Hyman Rickover, who was a submariner out of the class of 1922, uh, became an engineering officer, and it was his almost 
independent decision to somehow put nuclear power into a submarine. This, this happened in, in the late 40s because by 1955, the first nuclear powered submarine went to sea. Uh, that was Nautilus. She had a hull just like the other submarines, but she was powered by a reactor that gave her essentially uh, unlimited un underwater endurance and much more speed over, over a long period of time than any submarine could before. Uh, from there, they started saying, well, if we could improve the hull form, we could go better even faster. And indeed, they built a couple of experimental ships with a very streamlined hull looking like, if you explain it to a layman, like a Zeppelin. And uh, Albacore, for example, was one of those test vehicles. Uh, she, had, she was a small ship, had a lot of battery power, and extremely well-designed, fine hull, and she could make much more speed for a much longer time than anything that any submarine propelled by a battery before. But they used that, ex that experiment to then couple that new hull form to the nuclear power. If we had had something like that during World War II, those ships would have been able to roam the Pacific and be untouchable, and uh, obviously they would have wiped out the Japanese quicker than we did, even though we did a pretty good job. After the war, Admiral Rinskoff assisted in the development of modern submarine fire control and tactics, and during the Cold War, he commanded two submarine flotillas. The modern training of submariners that began during World War II continues.